So hi everyone, my name is Mio Kulongowski, as I just said, and today I'll try to make a little introduction to Rust pro programming language for you. Uh, okay, space works. So what can you expect from this talk? Uh, well, maybe some of you saw the agenda, but we'll start, of course, with some introduction. Then I will show you how easy it is to create new project and you know, start rusting. I'll talk briefly about the modules. Then we will go over to the code related stuff like types, variable declaration, data structures, different kinds of flow control. And after this, we'll have a big topic that is borrow checker and some traits introduction at the end. This talk is not live coding. It's rather a quick walk through Rust's language so that you know what tools it offers to programmers. So kind of know what you can prepare yourself for. <clears throat> So what is Rust? It's a relatively new programming language. It began as a project in 2006. Uh, the first table release was in 2014. It emphasizes performance, type safety, and concurrency, and is doing all of these safely and without race conditions. The best way to get started is to use their official page. Uh, you can see it right here. Um, they have lots of great materials over there, like uh, tutorials and, and documentation, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of it, and very, you know, well written. Apart from the from that, Rust offers a lot from the get-go. You know, uh, you have Rust app, which is their installer and version manager. You have Cargo, which is their build tool and a package manager. Um, so the Rust app is for the version of the, you know, Rust itself and compiler, et cetera, and the Cargo is for the a version of multiple packages that you can download. And there's also Clippy, which is a linter that helps you write better. And also it has a lot of tips about writing more like Rust-ish code. Like, you know, when you write, for example, in Python, you can write code that is valid, but you can also write in a more Python-ish way. And it's kind of the same in here. And the Clippy that is kind of built in already helps with that. So that's great. And there's also Rust FMT, um, this one here, and that's auto formatter. So and yeah, it's it's a lot. And there's also Rust doc, which isn't on the slide, which is a very powerful tool for documentation. It includes uh, checking of documentation, generation of it. You can also have code snippets that behave as tests, and they're you know compiled and checked as as far as they can be uh, in the documentation. So it's a lot of very powerful tools from the get-go. You know, you start with the Rust and you get all of these goodies uh, along with the compiler as well. So that's nice. Uh, so what do you do when you, how do you create even a new project? So when creating a new project, you install Rust via Rust app. Then you go to some location and simply call cargo new um, and the project name. And this creates a project directory with proper git directory uh, get ignore file, cargo file, and main.rs. And mind that this git directory normally is full. I just um, cut out the stuff from here so it's, you know, readable on the slide. So what's cargo.toml? So this is a description of a project for package manager. So for uh, cargo, uh, of course. And it's used both when building project, uploading to the crates crates.io, crates.io, which is like their official repository, or for example, citing dependencies. So you can see there is like, you know, braces, dependencies, braces over here section. And the TOML stands for Tom's Obvious Minimal Language. Don't know why, they just chose this one. We also have a main RS and initial main RS holds hello world code, as you can see, just printing stuff. And you can build your project simply by, you know, being in the directory and calling cargo build. This will basically build the project and create executable. You can also call cargo run to build a, build the project and run it afterwards. And you can also call cargo check to build the project without creating an executable, which is kind of faster. And it's I think very useful for checking project mid coding. If you don't want to run it, but you want to make sure that compiles and things is tip top, you want to see you know um, tips from the Clippy 
uh, maybe formatted with uh, Rust of MT, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, cargo check is your front end. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, so I've mentioned that cargo file can be used for stating dependencies. Um, and by that, I mean external modules, as I said, you know, like um, uh, some some math library or something like this, or maybe some HTTP library. Um, and there are many ways of declaring external modules built by simply stating version, and it will be downloaded from crates IO, like, you know, this club, uh, the club module. You just say the version and that's it. Um, you can state an online repository, for example, like the run module over here. We just gave them a Git, a GitHub link, and we said that this is uh, a Git repository and that's it. And you can also um, simply give a path in the local file system to another project. For example, let's say that I have another Rust project called bar. Uh, you know, in the same project uh, parent directory. Yeah, and I can just say it like this. So let's talk a little bit more about modules. They're kind of similar to Python modules, in my opinion, and a little bit to current C++, but not the C++ modules. Uh, it may be weird, but maybe you will see it in a second. So you declare module via calling the mod uh, module name uh, with semicolon at the end. And just to let compiler know that such module will be used in the current file. Um, so implementation can be both inline or in other files. So this keyword is kind of like a declaration and import in the same statement. You can also rename modules via use keyword, uh, like this use module name. And this is quite close to C++ using, using namespace functionality. Though in my opinion, it's also very Pythonish actually. Uh, so, for example, you can import math module, uh, you know, and and then like by doing mod map, and then you can shorten the namespace by using, for example, use math. Um, you can import like add method from it by using you know math operations uh, operators add. Maybe you wanna rename it, then you can import it, you know, as some other name, for example, add as other. Uh, you can import multiple um, functions from the same space, for example, by using uh, curly braces. And it, it, the curly brace can be nested, you know, so this import statement may be, you know, quite convoluted, but uh, you still will be sure that you only import the stuff that you need. Or, of course, you can simply import everything from the same space. Um, this one is good, for example, for casting away the full name of enum. For when you, for example, in C++, when you do switch, you would cast away your, you know, whole enum prefix. So yeah, this could be useful in here to use it only inside the method. So you don't need to write too much. Here we can see type comparison. So bool is the same. Uh, for integers like int8 underscore t, int16 t, int32 t, int64 t, we basically have, you know, the mirrored ones like i8, i16, i32, i64, and a bonus one, i128. We don't have, uh, we only have like um, specific sized uh, types in here. Uh, for the unsigned types, it's basically the same stuff as you can see, uh, just u instead of i. So yeah, very close. Um, char in Rust is actually very different from the from our understanding because uh, on our uh, in C++ it's kind of you know int 8 u int 8 t int 8 t it's you know it's just length of of uh, the length of uh, variable but in Rust char is actually single utf32 code point so you know it can hold emotes and other stuff a uh, u size is uh, basically uh, their size t and i size is the point of t. So yeah, it's kind of close. The names are similar, so it's quite easy to, you know, switch over. I can see some stuff in the chat. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, uh, yeah, building level, uh, well, that took seven seconds. Yeah, we'll look at this at the, at the end. Uh, but I will check out what you have written later on as well, okay? 
Um, so now that we know the basic types, let's say we can declare a variable. For this, we use the keyword to let. Uh, first line declares a variable x, as you can see. It's of type u8, and it's initialized to value 5. Second line is variable y, with a deduce type initialized to value 5. And in this context, it would be i32, which is default for numbers. You can also assign five casteds to u8, which will, you know, deduce type to u8 as well. You can use a literal uh, like such, and it will always be u8. For readability, you can also use uh, whatever number of underscores you prefer, because they will be ignored, like here is 10,000 uh, i32 type, and here is 10 u8 type, because we are using literal, but, you know, just using underscore to move it away. <clears throat> Important thing to note is that Rust is const by default. So if we declare a variable x like this, just let x equal 5, uh, we'll get an error when we try to assign a value to it, right? like we assign it to 10, right? And to make it mutable, we have to explicitly use keyword mute, mute, mute during the declaration, like let uh, mute y equal to 5, and then we can reassign it, and there won't be any error. So you may think that the types of action is something to fully understand, as we have auto in C++, but there is a small difference uh, that I think is very nice. So in C++ type must be deduced at initialization, whereas in Rust it may be delayed. So here variable uh, x would normally be i32 from the initialization, because it's no default number. Um, but because in the first usage we added to a u64 uh, variable, it will be actually deduced to also be u64. Um, so all of this will be u64, you know, based on deduction. And the same, for example, vectors below. Uh, so vec is a vector of i32s. Um, vec2 is some vector of some type we don't know yet. And because we push, we can push to vec uh, number 12 because this i32, and we can push to vec2 uh, number 12 as well, which will actually make this vector a uh, vec of i32. If we would push here, for example, um, string, then this would probably be vector of strings. But we don't know it here yet. And that's actually a very, very nice feature. There's also something called shadowing. <clears throat> it's when you can declare a new variable with a name of already existing variable, and the new one covers the old one. So you can see example on the slides. Um, and important things over here to notice are First, we redeclare variables, so both type and mutability can be changed. So you can see that here it's i32, here it's f32, for example. So that's the difference. I didn't change mutability any in here, uh, anywhere in here, but you can actually do let x equal 5, and then let mute x equal, for example, x as f32. Mm, also, and the second thing that's important is that the own value is not destroyed by this. It's like, you know, its name gets stolen away by a new variable. Um, but if these new variables are destroyed, then the like newest available, the old value, let's say, um, is still available. And you can see example here with y. So we get some i32 number that's 123 in here. Then we have nested braces <clears throat> where we create new variables that are shadowing this one. And they have different values, maybe different types, because let's say that this one returns uh, f32, then this one returns string. So it's like, you know, uh, a lot of different types. And if you, when we print it, we can see that it prints string. Um, but when we print the same y in here, it will still print the last known value to the y, which is the one before uh, braces. I think it's kind of useful mostly when returning variable. So instead of you know, um, having x and then being x, x under, uh, underscore flow, x underscore string, et cetera, et cetera, you just do, you just override the x doing let x equal, I know, like like in here, let y equal y dot to string, and then you return y, for example, because it's, I think, um, it is the same variable, you just cast it to other type, and it's kind of cleaner instead of having uh, 10 variables with the same prefix but different uh, suffixes, you know. 
Uh, here we have some other primitives available in Rust. So static is used to define a variable with static lifetime. It's located at the fixed location in the memory. Uh, but due to how safety checking works in Rust, a mutable, mutable static is possible, but it's unsafe. So it's preferred to use, for example, atomic values, which can be changed without a mute keyword. Apart from that, we have consts, which are basically the same as defines from C++. They're inline at the compile time. So it's kind of important that static will only have, you know, one instance, whereas uh, const will have will be inlined everywhere. So um, you don't want it to be, for example, I don't know, some um, constructor or something like this. It's just a const value. And we also have tuples, which can we can return them from methods. We can assign them to variables. As you can see here, there as as a, a return time from the method. And we can assign them to values. They can be of different types, as you can see over here as well. And we can also de deconstruct them into, you know, specific variables as well. Um, uh, yeah, and that's it for the for these primitives. Let's go to the slices, uh, as these are pretty important and they work kind of like array view. It's a non-owning wrapper on some array, right? So on slide you can see differently initialized arrays, uh, which are of fixed size and a method called such array. So I right. So here we have <clears throat> here we have two arrays versus uh, array of i thirty twos of length five. Second is of i thirty twos of length five hundred. They're initialized, uh, you know, with either either explicitly with values or uh, implicitly with like the length and the value to be copied. Uh, here is some method that takes in slice, and here we, for example, call uh, this method giving it slice, which is just you know ampersand and uh, uh, array that that we create slice from. Uh, on the right side, we have ranges which can be constrained from both sides. Uh, so either one of them, or, or I mean both sides, either one of them or none. So as you can see, you have ranges constrained from both. Uh, from and two are constraints from only one. The full one is constrained from uh non ends let's say none of them uh, neither of ends uh, and then we have branch inclusive or two inclusive where the uh ending value can or you know can be inclusive it doesn't need to be but normally as in c++ it's not i mean in c++ oh well uh sorry uh you can use this uh you can use these ranges for example, for iterating, you have here iteration from 1 to 11, uh, or maybe you know from 0 to size of something if you if you need, right? But you can still use ranges for this. Um, and they can also be used for creating subslices of arrays. So here we have the same method, ally slice, right? And we use different slice, the ys instead of xs, but we only give them a subslice that is from index 1 to index free because this is non inclusive. Um, so yeah, this is also important stuff. Um, the structs is and there are very important stuff in here um because we all love classes. So the question is what do we do here? Because in Rust there are no classes actually. Uh, if you want to hold data together, struct may be your best option. So we have three types of structs in Rust. They're like C like structs, tuple structs and unit structs. So select structs are the most standard ones. They hold names fields within. In our example, we have a personal struct that holds a string name and u8h. Uh, looking below, we can construct it in two ways. First is when we have variables that are named the same as struct fields, right? So we have name that's a string. We have age that's u8. I mean, it will be u8 deduced based on its usage. And then we basically create person uh, Stating the type in here, curly braces, and then uh, and then giving the their uh, values for all the fields and this order for all the fields. You you cannot just specify some of them. Um, and because we have variables that are named exactly as the fields of the struct, you will know what to do with them. The second way of constructing them is by specifying the field name followed by semicolon, followed by a value. So we have, for example, let's say that we want h to be the same as h field of the Peter struct. 
and the name to be a new string John. right um also the CLI extracts can be deconstructed so for example here we create two variables nn and aa the nn variable will be assigned the name of the person struct that is john and aa will be assigned the age of the person struct that is john right simple enough next we have tuple structs which are basically just named tuples uh, we have a point struct over here that holds two i32s we can construct and deconstruct it basically the same as you know as with a c struct so you just give values in here uh, because the names are not named, you don't, you know, you, you don't put any names in here or values. And you can deconstruct, for example, P1 to, you know, to value of none and Y. Uh, the fields can be accessed by indices, like in here, for example, the first value will be dot zero, then the second value will be dot one. And there is this underscore that I've used here, and it's a special variable name that lets Russ know that the value won't be used and it can be dropped from the get-go. So we're just saying we don't care what happens with the, the um, first value from here. Also, uh, please note the braces. In the structs, we had curly braces, both in here in the declaration and in the initialization. In tuples, we have uh, normal uh, round braces, both here and here, right? It's very important, actually. And the last one is unit structs. Uh, they are fieldless and they are useful for generates and stateless traits. I will show you an example at the end of the presentation to kind of see how they can be used and what it's actually for. Apart from structs, there is one more super important data struct that is enum. They're actually a lot more important in here than C++. They can be either fieldless, like great enum on the bottom, uh, with values fail and pass. Uh, just like our enum class, or they can be data carrying enums like web event over here. Um, and basically the variants of this enum, they can be anything that's valid as a struct. So for example, there's the page load and unload, which is unit structs. You have key press and paste, which are tuple structs. And you have click, which is basically a C-like struct, right? And the reason, why it's possible is because underneath it's being held as a union with a tag, basically. Here we have an example of signing an enum value to variables. Um, the last line of the left is the construction, as you can see, uh, and it's actually not allowed. You cannot deconstruct the enum in such manner because you don't know which variant is actually being used. I mean, you cannot be sure. Um, and this is possible using if let or while let, which we'll discuss later. Um, but in here, let's say that's not still not possible. Uh, also on the right side, you can see some enum usage with a match, and it's basically like C++ switch on steroids. St uh, steroids. Uh, here we simply match all enum values, capture the create values, and print the message. You can see for you know for uh, for the uh, valueless uh, fieldless uh, structs over here, we don't capture anything. Here we capture a uh, value, and here we capture both values. And please note that the braces are still different for double structs around for structs currently ones. Uh, we know from Splatter that enums have discriminators, the, you know, this integer value underneath. And as in C++, it can be actually implicit or explicit, as we can see with our number or color over here uh, enumerations. Mm -hmm. We can specify, uh, you know, the discriminator type via uh, rep like representation uh, attribute. So, for example, our overflowing uh, enum, this one here, has U8 used underneath based on this representation. But in the current form, it wouldn't compile because uh, the first value has 100, 225, uh, 255 uh, over here. So, the next one will be incremented by one, which would be 256. This would overflow uh, as a U8. So, this would be a compile error because we have explicitly stated. With this representation, it would work if you just, you know, uh, choose the best type possible, uh, the best type possible. But in here, when we uh, say this explicitly, it's not possible. Uh, so other than integer representation, there's a special case that is C representation, that is 
uh, you know, visible over here. And this is basically default behavior of C compiler. Um, it's not very well specified as you can hear from what I called it, but uh, I think it's mainly used for some um, compatibility uh, when cross compiling, I think. As of course, as you can see, uh, implicitly from zero, when you have some explicit value, then you bump up to this value and then you still go, you know, one by one. Mm. So please note that if representation is not explicitly specified, the compiler may change, uh, you know, however it will see fit. But this also means that an enum with a single value can actually be zero size and there can be no discrimination at all because it will be compiled away because you don't need it sometimes. Uh, one last thing regarding the enums is that only fieldless enums can be casted into integer values. So this, you know, zero, one, two, et cetera, red, blue, green. So here we can do this cast, but uh, to U8, for example, but if you would have value enums that are, you know, uh, tuple-like or, you know, uh, maybe more like this, if we have enums that are, uh, that doesn't have values, we can cast them to, uh, you know, U8 and discriminator values, uh, discriminator types. If we have this type of enums that hold values, you can cast it because, well, there's some, you know, uh, more variables uh, in them anyway. We also have unions in Rust, but I doubt that any beginners would use them as reading from unions is unsafe and writing to unions um, is safe, but only under special conditions. So maybe it's worth mentioning here what safe and unsafe means. Rust normally does a lot of checking of the code during the compilation uh, and maybe sometimes quite restrictive. Uh, so, but but this makes sure that we are rid of whole groups of specific bugs, but may sometimes feel you know this may sometimes feel limiting. So for such situations, there is possibility of marking some part of your code as unsafe, which would make compiler omit all these strict rules while checking such part of the code. Though I highly advise you try to use safe Rust at the beginning, uh, as much as you can, as unsafe should only be used when you're hundred percent you know sure and conscious of what you're doing. In case when you simply think that unsafe is your only choice, this may actually mean that some part of your existing code maybe should be rewritten, um, at least at the beginning, because uh, yeah, it makes you write in other way, but but uh, but safe for us do have a lot of uh, advantages that I'll also uh, talk about later on. Now let's go through flow control. So we start with standard if statement, same as everywhere here. Uh, you need to use braces for the body and there are no braces for the condition, right? So no brace for the condition, very Python-ish, brace for the body, very C++-ish. Um, so all ifs and whiles are expressions in Rust. So that's a little bit different. So because these are expressions, you can assign them to a variable. So we can assign whole expression if else to some variable, um, which would make this uh, I32, or I mean, probably based on the type of N, uh, but yeah, if N is uh, big enough, it will be 100. If this is, if it's small enough, then it will be N, that's it. Um, but uh, yeah, it sometimes comes in very handy actually. Uh, and you can, you know, return switches and return ifs from the function, etc. cetera. Um, while simple as can be, you check condition, you perform the action. It's basically the same everywhere. No need to, you know, talk any talk more. We have special statement called loop, which is while true. And to finish this loop, you of course need to use break. So when using nested loops, you may sometimes need to name them and these names like outer and inner and these names can be later used along with break statements to break out of a specific loop level so you can see that uh, here we have count uh, we you know multiply it by 10 and assign it to the count yet again and we basically do this in outer loop and only breaks we have are in inner loops so we know that we can only break from the inner loop from inside here so we either do the break in here which will you know go again to the outer, or we can do break outer, which would break from this level 
from all the levels up to this one. So we would go out of the whole loop inside uh, from here. And as I have said previously, we can assign, assign all of this flow control stuff to variables. So we could, for example, do a loop over here and we can check some condition. I, I know this could be a while, but you know, just, just uh, showing that it can be done. Uh, you can loop through stuff and then you can return a value with break uh, like this. And this value will be returned from the loop. So if we assign the variable, uh, this result would be equal to counter probably equal uh, 20, I would say. We also have a very standard range for, for n in the range from one to 100, print stuff. Uh, from, you have, we have some vector, this is a special initialization for a vector uh, with, you know, with already some values inside. Uh, so we have some vector with both Frank and Ferris with the strings inside. We it, we get the iterator from this and we basically iter it and, you know, print stuff so it's ranged for all the way. Here we have a flat, very important stuff. Uh, so when I said we kind of deconstruct enums, yeah, we can, and we can do this using this one. And uh, we need to make sure, you know, our code is ready for cases when the deconstructed enum is of different variants. So here we have very popular enum option, which is kind of the same as std optional, but here we have just an enum with two variants, none and some, uh, which is a tuple struct, you know, some with uh, a value of type T. In example, we have vector of uh, options. And the third one is none. All of the other ones are some. And here we iterate it. And for each value, we try to deconstruct it. So if we are able to assign number to, if we are able to deconstruct number and assign it as a sum with value i, then let's assign the value to i. And let's go on with the statement. If we are unable to, then we just don't enter this if, and we go over, you know, uh, forward. So this would print three, five. Uh, this would, you know, go into the if and seven. So three, five, seven. We can also do the same with while let, um, but it will only consume elements until it meets the first value that can be matched. So we, we basically do the same. We have some iterator over this vector. And then we you know call next on the iterator for each time. Uh, and as long as the next value can be assigned to, you know, will be a variant sum, then we'll deconstruct and get the value y, i. If it can be, then we basically, you know, go out of the while. So this will print three, five, and then we'll go out at the non value. The last statement I want to show you was match, and you already seen it with a web event enum. And you can see in the example that the single branch can match actually multiple values. It can use ors, ranges, etc. So here we match single value, that's one. Here we or and match two, three, five, seven, or eleven. Uh, here we match all from 13 to 19 inclusive. And here we basically do a default, which is you know, handle all other cases. Um, and this is actually very important because I think that unlike C++, I'm not sure if it's uh, right now it's obligatory or not, but in Rust, you always need to match all the possible values. And uh, if you have match that doesn't match, if you have match statement that doesn't match all possible values for the given type, the code won't compile. That's it. Uh, and of course, apart from matching multiple values and here, as you can see, we can uh, deconstruct apples, struct slices, we can add some guards like matching this range or this uh, type of enum variant, but only if some additional conditions passed. So for example, you could match all digits up to 100, but only if they're divisible by two. Um, so yeah, there's like a lot more with, you know, with the matching statement. So let's leave the flow control for now and start talking about borrow checker, which is actually super important for a young uh, Rustations and the bane of many. In Rust, each value has an owner. There can be only one owner at a time. And when he goes out of scope, the value will be dropped. So the variable lifetime can be assumed to be defined not only 
by scope, but rather scope and usage, in my in my opinion. Uh, but you, will, I think that you will get a little bit lighter about it uh, when we when we see the examples. So here we have simple code snippet. We create string one from you know from hello. We assign it to S two, and then we print S one. And C plus plus that we have to use copy sitter and you know just work. But in here, boom, we have error. So rest is moved by default. So this would file simple types uh, like uh, simple types like ints would be copied here as long as they you know implement a copy trait marker, which is a specific trait which states that the type memory can be copied bitwise. No, it can be mem copied. Uh, but string is similar to CPP. It holds pointer to a data length capacity. So copying it would only copy a pointer to the data. So it's not. You cannot copy it bitwise. It's like not copied. It it won't copy all of it, right? And because data will be somewhere else. Uh, so in this case, Rust will move the value. Uh, as as I said, there can be only one owner, and you can see the error. It's I think very readable, and it's also uh, other stuff that's very nice and you know to see uh, when you write code. Uh, you can see there's a borrow of move value s one. You can see that the move occurs because s one has type string, which does not implement the copy trait. And you can see that has been moved over here to S2. And then there is a value borrowed that's as one that has been already moved over here. So yeah, I will say I will talk about the borrows a little bit later on, but you kind of see that yeah, it has been moved and you we wanted to use it afterwards. And that was bad. So to probably copy a string, we would need to, be able to perform a deep copy, which can be done via clone method, like so. And then we can actually use both S1 as and S2 because you know we just did a deep clone over here. Um, and remember that Rust will never perform deep copy implicitly. You need to do this explicitly. The same with you know mute keywords. Uh, let's go through this code along uh, with the comments uh, to make sure that we fully understand where what will be destroyed. So we have three methods: main and takes ownership and makes copy, as you can see. Um, takes ownership, it takes some string into the scope and takes by values that probably will be moved over here. Um, and makes copy as a function that takes some integer also by value. Uh, yeah, and they don't return anything important. So let's see what happens in main. We create a string from S, it comes into scope. Then we call the takes ownership value S and we you know with this S and this value will be moved because we have it, you know, by, by, by the interior, so that we moved. There is no reference. Uh, so after actually calling this, the S is already moved, so it can't be used because it won't be valid. It will cause an error if you try to print S over here or do anything with this with it. <clears throat> um, so if we call if we call this takes ownership, we have you know some string that comes in scope in here. We print it, and then some string in here goes out of scope. And it will be dropped, which is basically, you know, dropped is like a distractor over here. So the backing memory will be freed after, you know, after this call finishes. Uh, we go back to main. There is let x equal assign 5 to x. Uh, this i32 comes into the scope. Here we call makes copy of x because x implements a copy trait. It will be copied, not moved. Uh, and because of this, uh, here we have some, you know, new instance of i32 that has the same value as x. We print it, boom, that's it. Uh, and then here we can use both x. Uh, we can use x as well over here, uh, even though it has been you know called in a, in a method because, as I said, it implements copy trade, so it will be copied. Um, nothing, nothing's wrong. Then x goes out of scope. Uh, then s, s values have been moved, so nothing special happens to it. X is just uh, you know pod value, so it's on the stack. So apart from copying and moving, we also need to consider lifetimes. It's a special thing in Rust that each variable has, <clears throat> and more often than not, it's actually that used implicitly. So the lifetime will be uh, you know with a small um, small tick over here and some letter. Um, so we have this code example in here. We have variable r that is uh, moved by any value, not you know, not, not initialized. Then we have an s that scope over here. We create value x, we assign five to it. 
Um, we then assign uh, we then assign reference to an X. Uh, we assign to R a reference to an X. Then we uh, leave the scope. The X is destroyed, and then we try to print it. So I have drafted the lifetime of an error, right? It's initialized here. It goes out to scope here. The X is initialized here, goes out to scope here. So we kind of know that the R will point out point at the uh, variable that has been deinitialized. So of course, <coughs> it will draw an error saying this: we borrowed a value, and it doesn't live long enough because X was dropped in this line, right, and here, while we while it was still being borrowed, and then we use this borrow later in the print line over here. Yet again, super readable errors. So to avoid moving or copying, uh, we can pass stuff by reference, for example. And in this example, uh, we have a method calculate length, uh, which takes a reference to a string and returns u size. And when we create a string, a variable as one, then we call function which borrows this variable, like you know, just calculate length and returns its length. And we can print both of them. A uh, string was only borrowed and uh, not moved, so S1 will be still valid over here, you know, after the call. Um, and that's all we had to do, you know, borrow instead of <clears throat> uh, instead of moving the value. We can, of course, also have mutable references, and that is a reference to, you know, a mutable object. So first of all, but it needs to be mutable, you know, it needs to be mutable to let us pass the reference that is both normal or mutable. Um, and also the method needs to declare that it expects a mutable reference because if it won't, it's kind of like, you know, like you would declare a const. It doesn't matter if you pass a const or a non-const value, it will be seen as a const one. So yeah, we create a mute uh, string for here. We pass a mutable reference uh, to it, the method change, and the method change expects, expects a mutable reference to the string, and it pushes, you know, uh, additional substring to it. I mean, this is a very good difference between Rust and C++ that you need to put additional work to use non-const variables and you know deep clone stuff, etc. Instead of having to put const anywhere, and um, so it kind of uh, puts em uh, emphasis on it puts emphasis on the important stuff that uh, you know the stuff can change here. Watch out! Instead of putting emphasis on hey, you cannot change the stuff because um, it's, in my opinion, that it's like more important and better to do this this way. But you know, everyone has um, their own opinion. So it's all good that mutable reference exists, but you can only have one mutable reference to a value at once. So this code we have mute uh, variable s. We have two references, r one and r two, and we want to print both of them, which should kind of get the same value. Well, this code will file in Rust. Uh, because we have the mutable borrow over here, and that's okay, but you do a second mutable borrow over here, and that won't compile because you cannot borrow S as mutable more than once at a time. Also, the first borrow is later used over here. It can be important. Uh, I said about lifetime a little bit earlier, and I will continue it uh, further into the presentation. As you can see, you, you will know why, why it's important that it's used later in here. It's kind of an infrastructure, but it actually prevents data races, uh, which are often you know very tough to find. So, uh, yeah. And even though you can, uh, I mean, okay, you kind of can have multiple borrows, uh, mutable borrows, but they're not simultaneous. That's something I said about usage. So this code will compile without any problem, mainly because we have this S. We have you know two different borrows, um, but R1, for example, goes out of scope here. So we so you know this, it, this reference is ended, so we can create a new one. And the same would be if we were to use it somewhere else. And I think that there should be another example of this one. Um, so what with the immutable references? So we can actually have infinite amount of immutable references, right? Like without multiple like this one, this one. Uh, at the same time, and it's kind of understandable because the value is read only. So 
you kind of have certainty that it won't change. So you can, you know, if you only have consumers that fit the value, you can uh, you can do this uh, without any mutexes. <clears throat> but the problem happens when you want to mutably borrow value, like R3, that already has immutable borrows on it. And that is because consumers of immutable reference don't expect the value to suddenly change. So if you have guys that are read only and they don't expect to change, you cannot simply give, you know, edit access to somebody. So let's check the error over here. You cannot borrow S as mutable because it also is borrowed as immutable. Immutable borrow over here, the first one. The second one is simply you no know, omitted because they don't care about it. And then there's an immutable borrow over here. Um, and the immutable borrow is actually still in power because it's used later on. So it's kind of borrowed beforehand and used after uh, after uh, after the immutable borrow. As I said at the beginning, the lifetime often is tied to both owner and usage. So the usage is kind of important. Here we have three references, you know, the kind of same, two immutable ones, one mutable. And this code actually compiles. Um, because even though, you know, all of this reference, all these variables have ownership, they go out of scope at the same time at the end of the main. Um, but for these borrows, the last usage is here before borrowing mutably. So the compiler sees that you have this uh, immutable borrows over, over here. And even though they don't go out of scope, they won't be used after this line. So you can actually assume that they're non existent because they're no longer used. And yeah, and that's. That's the magic that happens here where we can actually get this mutable borrow in here and then print stuff. It's very easy and you know and readable when I show it with some printing and like one after the other. But afterwards, when you just um, uh, call a lot of functions and some nested loops, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, this error will haunt you for some time at the beginning until you fully understand how this borrowing actually works and you know and um where it's important to it for it to be borrowed when it is copied when it's moved etc etc et uh, but it's it's gets easier with time so yeah no problem uh so that's for borrow checker uh let's really finish the talk with some traits introduction traits are like groups of methods defined together um trait author declares some functionality and others then can implement this behavior for their type <clears throat> So it's something like an interface. Here we have a trait to string uh, over here, which uh, defines a single method taking a reference to self. And self is like this in C++, and then returns the string. We then implement this trait for our grade enum over here. Yeah, right? Implement to string for grade enum. That was file and pass. Uh, and so we have the same. Uh, method uh, declaration here and then we put an implementation inside with simply maybe doing a match on self uh, if self is great fail variant then let's return the string from fail and if it's a pass variant then return string pass so there's no return statement in here because in function the uh, last statement without semicolon is the return statement and it's more than without semicolon and because uh, all flow control, you know, ifs, whiles, matches, they are expressed as I said, so they can be both uh, assigned to variable or maybe returned. So in here we return the value of this match statement, and the match statement either returns this string or this string. So it all kind of you know ties together and works. Uh, here is also a trait copy marker. You can see how this actually looks. And it looks like this, it's just an empty trait, uh, the same copy. And as I said, it's just saying that this types, the memory of this type can be copied bitwise. Rust has a couple of such traits that are kind of important for, you know, zero for compilation to check um, if all of this, you know, works as it should. Um, and to check some, you know, uh, specific stuff like uh, 
Hmm. Uh, like in some asynchronous calls, you can check if uh, if this type can be um, passed, you know, in uh, between threads, for example, if it's thread safe or not, and you know, or just if you can copy it safely, but by you know, bitwise or not, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a lot of these great markers that are in Rust um, in standard library that uh, you don't see even that much, but they all are working, you know, under the hood over there. So trait authors can also provide already implemented methods like this one. And they may use everything that the trait has to offer. So if I have the method print string, I can actually use this method to string. I don't know what it will return apart from that, you know, it's like will be string um, because there's no body over here. But, you know, kind of as, as in, you know, interfaces or, or other stuff, you assume that it will return what you want it to return. And what that will deem, you know, proper in this in this uh, instance, uh, and yeah, and you can use it in some other methods. So it may be useful sometimes uh, when you just need some one value, and then you can, you know, change it uh, in a couple of different ways. Uh, so subtraits, there's no inheritance in Rust, no classes, no inheritance. <laughs> But some traits can be supersets of other traits. So we have a hash print trait here that's a subtrait of, uh, there's a superset of, you know, traits of hash and to string. <clears throat> so an object that is implementing, uh, implemented, implementing, sorry, hash print, uh, it's required to also fully implement all of this, all of its super traits, that is hash and to string. So, but uh, as in as in you know uh, implementing default methods, you can also use everything that is used, for example, in here. So you can use all everything that is provided by hash, like hash function, everything that's provided by to string because you know you are uh, required to implement them anyway. Um, and that is you know kind of seen over here. We can also have two types of adding some type abstraction to traits. And first of them is type annotation. Uh, in our iterator trait over here, uh, we have defined two things that consumer needs to implement. A type that's called, that is called item in here, and a method that takes me to reference to self and returns an option of said item. Okay. And when implementing this trait for some counter struct, we implement item type to u32, and then we give somebody to next method that will return option of self item. We could also use just option of U32. It's basically you no know, the same uh, in here because it's like uh, using C++ or uh, type def. The second <clears throat> type of type abstraction is generics, which behaves like C++ templates. Uh, here we have a generic trait add that has both generic type RHS and type annotation output. Here and here, and a single method add that uh, we have over here, like self with RHS, and then we give output a uh, type of output value uh, uh, result. I mean, uh, we define two table structs called millimeters and meters, and implement add rate for one of them. So first we implement a millimeter to millimeter. Uh, addition, that's that we take advantage of the full generic parameter, um, right? There's just add over here because we know that uh, default is self. So add for millimeters will be you no know, millimeters in here by default. Um, and that we specify output type to over here and add, you know, add method body. Then we implement functionality for I think meters to millimeters over here and we specify output type method body as well as you can see and it all works um some of you probably noticed but main difference here is that using generic value to implement a trait for a single type multiple times uh, whereas type annotation only abstracts a single type so you can implement addition of millimeters and meters centimeters and miles but you can't implement meters and millimeters addition that returns meters 
and another millimeters and meters that returns millimeters. I mean, for a single trait or single trait of the given, you know, uh, type template type, you can only have one type annotation, and you you cannot, you know, uh, create generics based on this. So th this is the this is the only difference that's important, and it kind of makes sense while designing a trait uh, where you want to give, you know, how much uh, freedom to the to the user. There's also something alongside CPP con concepts. So we have traits hash and random hash. And generic extract pair of two objects that may have different types. We then implement random hash uh, over here, trait for all possible types A and B. Uh, yeah, but it's just you know, returning a random number. So kind of shitty method, kind of you know, restrictive. Uh, but we can try to implement hash a little bit better by doing a conditional trait implementation over here. Uh, and here we implement hash trait only for such types A and B that both implement hash a trait as well. So this kind of allows us to use methods belonging to this trait, just like in you know, sub traits. Uh, so we can assume that if type A is of uh, the variable, the first variable, the first one is of type A, or like here, and we know that it implements hash, we know that it will have hash methods, we can simply you know, do stuff like this. And uh, and if the types won't have, uh, if one of those won't have hash, then this implementation won't be simply available, that's it. Uh, okay, but how can we use this traits interfaces stuff? Well, we have standard static dispatch, uh, done through generics, identical to templates in C++. Uh, only used versions of a generic will be generated. We have two methods print hash that take parameter that's a reference to object implementing hash trait right here and here. Uh, second implementation is the impl hash is basically syntactic sugar for this templated one, but it's the same thing uh, underneath. Uh, there's also a significant difference between Rust and CPP, as CPP will actually check each generated version for errors, whereas uh, Rust actually check will be done once, and it's based on traits and type conditions. So here, compiler would actually uh, need to make sure that type T has access to method hash in here because we use it. And it can check it only knowing that it implements hash uh, trait. That's it. And if that's true, then all this, like the all, all the version of this uh, uh, of this template, will be actually true and valid. Under usage would be a dynamic dispatch, which is done via pointers. For example, a vector of traits is impossible because traits are unsized. So we need to use an indirection here, as you all well know, as so we can use either box that's pointer to a heap or uh, ampersand, you know, a reference that's pointer to anywhere. And such types like, you no know, box of uh, click callback or, uh, you know, reference to click callback, they're called trait objects. And they include a pointer to an instance of type T implementing a trait and a V table with pointers to implementations of each method in trait. So last but not least, sorry, I think that I'm uh, like a minute or two over time, but it's the last slide. Uh, I promise an example that shows usage of unit structs. And so we have a trait limit over here that provides method within limit that takes reference to self and the use size and returns bool. We also have a unit struct called unlimited over here and some function that uses static dispatch to take limit trait uh, object as a parameter. On the right, we can see implementation uh, for use size and for unlimited, right? In here and here. And for use size, we have a simple uh, we have a simple logic that returns true for values lower than limit, uh, right over here. And for unlimited, we have just always return true value. That's it. Um, so on the left, over here on the bottom. Uh, we have some methods, methods calls with unlimited and with use size over here. And the fun part is that the zero size arguments are omitted in the compiled code. <coughs> so this, uh, so this uh, unit struct will be actually compiled away. 
and the generated version of ransom code with a limit for the unlimited will be optimized will optimize the way the straight object parameter like this you know the stuff in here so the the parameter will be optimized away because it won't be used because it's uh, of you know zero size and all the branching used within this specific version of ransom code with a limit all the branching based on within limit uh, calls will be actually you know just uh, thrown out of the window and pruned because the compiler knows that it will always use this specific you know this will it will always i always return this um value uh, true in here right uh yeah and that's it let's check out questions in the chat because i've seen some stuff over here um let's see 